buddy of mine, Mr. Ken Harvey. Kenny, how are you today, sir? I'm good, man. Very blessed. It's, man, it has been a while since we have been in touch with each other. Definitely. It's good to see you. Absolutely. So what is what is Kenny Harvey doing these days? Still in baseball, man. It seems like, you know, God put me on this planet to uh, be a part of the game somehow. So uh, I went back to finish my degree, I don't know, about seven, eight years ago and was a grad assistant and was kind of coaching a little bit with Erstad and just kind of finding my niche and doing a private lesson thing and just kind of found me in Kansas now doing the travel ball thing with about six to eight teams, just loving what I'm doing. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to, so you're a kid, you're from Beverly Hills, California. Is that it? No, I'm from South Central California originally. Oh, originally. Did you go to high school in Beverly Hills? Yeah, I had to take shoot, public transportation an hour every day to school. So, I mean, I got the benefits of going to a good school, but I definitely did not live in Beverly Hills. I wish I <laughs> so, the, so the internet is not 100% truth then. Okay. I just want to make sure we get that that clarified. Right no, I now. definitely went to high school there. That's for sure. Okay. So you go to high school in Beverly Hills. Yeah. How do you end up in Lincoln, Nebraska? I mean, my heart was always set on going to some kind of California school. So uh, I was set on going to either Cal State Northridge or USC at the time. But an assistant coach of mine in high school played at Nebraska in 80-81. So he talked me into actually going on a trip. And that was pretty much all she wrote. I just fell in love with everything. And then the possibility of playing right away in the Big 12 was appealing as well. So it just felt like it was a good marriage up until, you know, it was freezing when I got there. They kind of didn't tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> they don't ever tell you about the bad stuff until it actually happens. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, you know, being, sir, you're a Cali kid and you're in the Midwest. What, I mean, what was the biggest shot other than the weather? I, I think being on my own and the weather, those were the top two, I think, which were probably the biggest assets of actually going away for, you know, minor league ball and, what was ahead of me so i think just growing up and not being a baby and relying on mom for everything was the biggest thing for me were you drafted out of high school no i was a definitely a late bloomer i got some attention but definitely did not get drafted at all <clears throat> so that's yeah so you you know people you know don't understand uh, you know listeners as far as you know you're a high school kid if you're drafted high you know you're given a boatload of money no structure you know, or you have the option to go to college, as you and I did, to kind of build into, like you said, being away from family and friends, understanding, you know, playing 50, 60 games a year in college, is, and then going into pro ball playing, you know, on your if you're in rookie ball, you're probably playing, what, I think another 80. So you kind of build yep. up to it, right? So you, so that's, I think that's a growing process that helped, I think, me, is, it, it sounds like with you as well, is, the maturity side of it, right? To be able to, to, to do that. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it took me a while. Uh, my mother makes fun of me to this day, uh, because it was, it, it was stressful. You know I mean? I had already decided to, you know, transfer to North Ridge and stay with my best friend, had all these plans and I hadn't even really played ball yet. And she asked me, you know, what did I go there for? You know, and then finally the weather started getting better. You know, you start getting new friends. I hadn't called her in two months. She called and hadn't heard from me. And I go, I'm having a blast now. So it just took that time of maturity of, you know, at least being comfortable with my surroundings. So you go, so you spent, where did you spend your first year of pro ball once you were drafted? I went right to short season in Spokane, Washington. Okay. Spokane and then what? Did you go right to Wilmington from there? Uh, yeah, the next year I went to high ball in Wilmington. Yes. Okay. But only like a month, I think, because I had foot surgery. Foot surgery. Oh, goodness. Yeah, it seems. So you were talking about, uh, I was reading, I was doing a little little background research on you, Kenny, as far as like, you talking about your last few years of um, of being, of, of injuries and everything else. And you were talking about um, in 2000, I think it was 15 or something, you had you were starting to have some some health issues. Uh, yeah, uh, basically had a high blood pressure issue that I didn't really know, uh, existed to the extent it was. So 
definitely ran into trouble with my kidneys. Uh, had a kidney transplant, all that. But, you know, God has blessed me. I'm doing very well today. Did that, I know, you, you know, I was reading up as well, as far as, you know, you had some back issues as well. Do you think any of that played into, you know, your career being just being cut short because of it? Or is it just something that, you know, like I said, our bodies are only able to carry and do so much, right? We're put through a lot of stress and everybody's different. You know, I just, do you ever look back and go, if, if I had to change something, I would have been able to do more of this? Do you oh, ever... definitely. Uh, my, my health, eating wise, working out wise, taking care of my body, doing all that stuff was uh, something I definitely could have done better. You know, obviously looking back, uh, you know, you always hear one of those things where you don't want to have any regrets looking back on your career. And that's definitely one that I have. Uh, I think we had a tribute in my AAA team where uh, a couple of us were being celebrated coming back, you know, out in Omaha, what have you. And our coach basically looked at both of us and like, how are you in better shape now than you were when you were 25 years old? You know what I mean? So that was something that I always struggled with was, you know, diet and exercise. Is it uh, so now, I mean, so now you've, you've taken what you've learned, you know, through your career to these kids and these, uh, what ages are these kids are you, t are you coaching? Are they all uh, 13 all the way up to 18 years old 18 years old. so you've so these kids you know traveling all around and and we've we you know, I talk about a lot on the show of, of how we as players affect these kids right and what we've learned to what we see on tv what you know what kind of questions do you get from these kids about the stuff that they see on tv as opposed to hey ken what are your thoughts on on this you know, it's the good questions. It's the the lifestyle of you know. Obviously, they want to know you know how it was in the playing in the MLB. Of course, they want to know that. But you know, it's always uh, situational kind of questions. I like to get you know my hitters to think about certain things. So you know, asking me what this guy may be thinking in this situation, and you know, how does that pertain to my approach and that kind of stuff. And then you know, the outside life of how did I deal with it? You know off the field, financially, uh, living stuff, you know, however I was married, dealing with married life and all that kind of question. So that kind of stuff, you know, really makes it seem like, you know, I was put in the right position to do what I'm doing. Yeah. To be able just to, to guide these, these, these young minds. So you've been, how long have you been doing this now? You've been coaching these kids? Uh, well, I've just moved out to Kansas City the last, I've been here maybe a year now, but, you know, I've been doing this, whether it's been in Colorado, Nebraska, and now in Kansas City for like 15 and a half years now. So you haven't left the Midwest. You've just, that the Cali boy is gone. Now is what you're saying? <laughs> That's so funny you bring that up. I got <laughs> about seven of my boys that I've basically grew up since, you know, we were 12 years old and. They just told me I can't even claim California no more. I'm a Midwest boy, is how they put it. So, but it seems it's it seems like it's helped you out though, as far as just you know, re, kind of just gather yourself with all you've been through and just being able to you know instill that. Do you ever go back to Cali? Of course, you know I mean I go back to visit uh, you know family every so often, but you know I can't be there for very long. I don't know how else to explain it. They take offense to it, but I don't mean it that way. It's just, it's too fast paced for me, you know, now. So I guess I am really am a Midwest kind of a guy. Are there uh, any of your former player teammates or anything that are helping you out? Or is it just something that you, you started this, this organization? No, I met this uh, guy, Matt Duncan through uh, future star series, a previous organization that I used to work for. And uh, we worked together for uh, two and a half, maybe three years, traveling all over the country, doing events together. And, you know, he's been trying to get me to come out here uh, for a few years now. So it took me a while, but it was just the right fit. So it's uh, me, him, and uh, another guy. We work you know, pretty tight together running the show. Are you still doing stuff with the Royals at all? No, I am not in tune with the Royals at all. No, is it just... So once you stepped away from baseball, you really kind of just stepped away from it? Me, yes. My first, shoot, five to seven years, I was pretty salty about how it ended or whatever. I guess my last year was pretty cool because, you know, independent ball taught me a lot about loving the game. So I went out the right way. 
but just, you know, as far as being close to the game, it just wasn't uh, in the cars for me at the time. Only my education was. What kind of, what soured you on it? I mean, I know we all have different stuff that we go through as players, you know, wanting to go out on your own terms, guys not being honest. Uh, what Nine sur- soured me on it. What did? Nine surgeries, not feeling like I had an opportunity to really play or, you know, a full season and be healthy. And it just felt like it was always something. Are you still, I mean, other than the kidney stuff, are you still dealing with any of the effects of that, of the of the surgeries and stuff? I mean, just like any ex-player, you know, depending on the weather, something hurts. But for the most part, I'm pretty healthy, you know, throwing BP every day, pretty active with the guys. I can't complain at all. My kids call me the coolest 44-year-old ever. That's that's what I, I'm dealing with that as well, trying to, you know, you get up some days, you feel like your body feels like it's 80. Other days, you feel like you're 20. It just... It just it just really varies. My shoulder, I think, I get a partial tear in it. It's just a matter of when it goes. I think I've learned to limit myself to what I can do. I th- I couldn't throw BP anymore, I don't think. I don't know how some guy, like, you can go out there and throw it. I don't know how guys do it, unless you're doing it on a daily basis. But phew, when I was coaching, uh-uh. I was using a pitching machine throwing curveballs. There's no way I could throw. Yeah, I'm using the pitching machine a lot. And, I mean, as we sit right here, my shoulder's throbbing. So it's like I pick my spots, but, you know, I'm blessed to keep doing it. The uh, I know you, you, being around kids and stuff, you see a lot of gimmicks and, and all this. I've had Jeff Fry's been on here. We've talked about a lot of stuff. I mean, is it are you just the kind of just down to the nuts and bolts of hitting and stuff and, and everything else? Or is there, you know, everybody has to have something. I mean, are you, you are you the old school guy where it's just a bat and a tee and, and go to work? Or, you know, what, what is your what do you what is your philosophy? You're teaching these kids. Yeah, I'm, I'm very old school ball tee short bat, leg work. I'm all about, you know, staying inside the ball and using your legs and using vision. So, uh, yeah, the gimmick stuff, I think there's always tools that can be used still with the old school mentality. But, yeah, I'm not into all the gimmicks and stuff like that. I use the technology, uh, you know, when it's needed and obviously to explain to a kid certain things, but I don't overly use it to the point where, it controls kind of what we're thinking about. So you're running, how many teams are you running right now? Uh, shoot, six. Six teams. So you're traveling every week, every on the weekends and stuff, or are you done right this time of year? Uh, right now, we've just been off for about a week and a half. So I'm on vacation time for about another two and a half weeks, and then we start fall ball. Okay. So you guys are traveling. You guys coming down this way at, at all playing down here in texas or are you guys just are you just staying around you know around kansas city and everything else well we just merged with a uh new company so a uh, lots and works right now as far as i know we have three main core places that we go to uh other situations of where we're traveling are up in the air right now so it's kind of hard to say so you have you have kids yourself these days kenny i'm sorry you have kids yourself yeah, I have a boy. How old? Twelve. Twelve. He's so you're so you're in the, in the throttles of all this stuff as well, trying to move him around as well. So, are you coaching his team or are you coaching the other ones? No, I just coach my guys. I don't. I let him get coached by whoever's coaching him. I want him to always hear another uh, voice, especially on the field and on the practice field. And when he asks questions, I'm there, but I don't want to control that aspect. I kind of took the first you know, nine years of his life. Now it's kind of let him do him, you know? That's what I did. I just, I retired about three, that's about six weeks ago. I got, I got, I finally said that I got to a point where the kids just don't want to listen anymore. Yeah. They just want, even you could tell them the same thing I, that I, you know, that I'd say, and they just, they just don't want to listen. I just got to the point of, okay, with two other kids, yeah. you want to watch them grow up and just, like you said, let them find their way. Yeah, you always hear about these coaches who get fired because, you know, they lost their voice in the locker room. And I keep always like, you know, what does that mean? They still listening to them, but it kind of came true because I could tell my voice was very mute. So it was kind of time to let him do his thing. And you and people always ask, you know, I have parents, well, when do you think you're going to stop coaching? I said, you, or you'll know. There'll be something that, that just kind of triggers it that you'll know. This was about the age my dad did because, you know, for certain reasons. And it was... 
that's what I wanted to do. And it was just one of those. Yep. It's time to, it's time to move on. And it's no, not everybody's the same. It, it's just a matter of, and I'll, you know, I still want to help out, but at some point we've got to be able to sit back and just enjoy and watch the kids grow up. Right. Absolutely. Especially when I do it pretty much 24 seven. So it's sometimes time nice to just sit in the stands and just watch a game and, you know, keep my thoughts to myself as much as I can. <laughs> And it's hard though, as as especially the level we played at, to just sit there and watch and not and not say anything. So I told people I'm going to get myself some noise canceling headphones, one of those plastic bubbles, and paint <laughs> the balls and everything else, and not say anything. Just sit there and just. And it's hard though to not yeah. to not want to because it's. I think it's 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 our innate ability to know the right from the wrong. I'm wanting to just and, and help help that process along and it's hard i mean i deal with my little ones with soccer and everything else you just what why aren't people doing x what's what's going on and and it's frustrating as anything to sit there and and deal with this yeah totally i realized for me very quickly that you know sitting in the outfield or down the foul line as far as i can is good for me because my mannerisms just tell everything so I just try to stay as far as away as possible, but as close as I can, if that makes sense. No, I, I, yeah, I understand. And it's just, you know, parents always, and the problem is you hear so much stuff of, from what parents say, because Google says it's this, right? And us, we, we don't want to engage it, but we also don't want to encourage stupid. Right? Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. You, you hear some crazy, crazy off the wall things that parents come up with and just, I mean, I even coaching rec softball for eight U for my little one. It's just I, people go, "Why don't you say anything?" Because I just get to a point where I just, I just, I just can't. I just we just don't want to be that guy, but yeah. it's hard not to be that guy when you know the right answer. Yeah, and it is, and it's different. Does your son play anything but other than baseball? What's that? Does your son play ba- other uh, play baseball? Play football? Or I mean, you're track. He runs track. Yeah, I don't know where he gets it from, but he likes to run. He gets that from you, dude. You were you were built for the speed. Run for my size, but I definitely didn't like to run. Me either. I, no, I, <laughs> you like to run, and I don't know where he gets that from. You're like me. You're built for comfort, not speed. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, like it's on my Facebook thing. Comfort over everything. <laughs> and I could never understand... Uh, Running 60, 60 yards. Um, baseball, we run 90 feet and we turn. I never understood what's it. Even if I have to run 60 yards in the outfield, the, more than likely the, the guy next to me is probably going to get it. So I never, that, <laughs> never understood why you just didn't time a guy from home to second base. I never understood that either. You just, and that's, and that's the thing because you look at that as far as what we deal with, you know, you're talking about the turns and everything else. If it's not a good turn, you're, you're slowing yourself down. And most kids don't know how to, right? They're just taught to run in a straight line. In a straight, exactly. So it's like you want a guy with technique and feel, but you don't test for it. Makes no sense. And even yeah, and it's and I'm sure. So you um, just being able to to teach the kids how to even hit in the right part of the bag. I mean, right? You'll and kids standing on the base and uh, they run around them. So we've t- we've taught our kids. We've put a we would take a tackling dummy, put it on the bag. And if it was in the way, tell them, look, run through it, right? You're, it's it's not dirty. It's it's the part of the game. You're entitled to the base. I th- something happened, I think, the other night um, in the, I think, the Orioles game about a play at the plate, right? And they're arguing catcher getting in the way. I mean, when we played, if you were in the way, you were going to get run over. Absolutely. And it was expected. So, but nowadays, the things are taught differently. Uh, so I totally agree. And I just, you know, you've got to, you've got to stop because, you know, you played first base and knowing what guys running through there, even for, even trying to stretch for a ball, there were guys that were dumb enough to try and step on the back of your foot, right? Oh, and did it on purpose with intent. So uh, I try to tell these guys all the day, it's like, there's a game and ship and then there's a dirty way of doing it, but you got to be prepared for both. Yeah, and that's and that's what the problem is. The kids don't understand how. Well, how will we know? I said, well, we'll, you know, I've never been one to run up a score on anybody, unless it's warranted. You know, a coach bad mouthing his kids, uh, you know, bad mouthing just whatever. I mean, I've seen coaches yell at kids for winning a game. You know, ah, you guys, all this crap, your asses are going to be running left and right when we get the press. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is somebody that needs to have the score run up on them, just for the simple fact of. 
talking to your team after they won a game of how bad they were playing. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it's, I'm sure you've, you've come across some stuff and watching other coaches that you sit across from there and just like, Hey, I mean, have you ever had any big incidents with other coaches just wanting to just to start something because they wanted to? Oh, I mean, our butt hurt because of the way the game is going. And yeah, we just got accused of, I think it was our second to last game in the semifinals, got accused of running up the score. And I mean, it wasn't anything of the sort. I mean, we could have stopped a guy at third base while the damn ball was by the fence, which makes no sense. But I think he was just mad in general. But, you know, my other coach is a yeller as well. So he kind of met his match. And then we proceeded to run rule them the next inning. So it was quite nice. And that's and that and that's what, uh, you know, the thing of, of you play, you know, some of these kids. Because, you know, right now this in our age, there's a lot of this stuff's watered down, right? There's so many just because they have money, they slap select on whatever, right? So it's so it's watered down. But you have teams that are say they're select playing at your level that can't catch a ground ball, can't catch a fly ball. You're putting up 15, 20 runs, and people think you're running up the score line. Now we're just playing, we're running station to station, you know. And people don't understand. Well, you're you're doing. I I can't stop the game. I mean, I can't make people catch the ball. Uh, you know, you see it in, in other sports. I, I mean, I've seen some coaches go well. I'm just going to keep going. Well, you're going to find out what happens real quick, you know? I mean, it's a fine line, but definitely you can't fault someone because you didn't teach your team the right way to catch the ball or be prepared, or they just may be struggling doing it. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a learning moment for them as well, but they can't take it that approach of, you know, trying to rub it in or stick it to them it's just the game yeah and you i mean do you do you see this with with your kids too of a lot of of them chirping amongst at other kids or is it something that's that's just been squashed early i I mean yeah biggest thing that i've kind of observed and kind of took control of was the dugout with all our teams because they didn't know the right way to do it so i thought i was really good at that so me talking crap and, you know, compare coming back to, you know, what a other dugout might say, you know, obviously not yelling it out because I'm too old to be doing that. But around my kids, you know, it makes them laugh and they see the wittiness and the smartness behind it rather than just not having a clue with what you're saying just makes no sense, you know. And it's you're right. It's, and it's, it's tough because they're getting to what well, great your son's going into seventh grade, eighth grade. Seven. OK. Yeah, so they're getting to that point, you know, where social media is starting to take over. You know, the cell phones are big, and these kids are seeing the stupidness that's on TV, right? These pitchers that are mm-hmm. that are doing stuff, these bat flips that are ending up halfway across the field, and you know, the, yeah, oh my gosh, and, and the kids see that though, so they, you know, they want to do well. Hey, well, he's doing it. Why can't I do it? Yeah, we just we just don't allow that. Plus, you know, I kind of put them in their place as far as having pop or power, however you want to say it. You know, they got to learn how to do it the right way. So I think if you, you know, put them in their place the right way and start, you know, you kind of try to nip that in the bud before it even starts. Do you, are you, do you notice it more with your old, with the older kids, you know, the 17, 18 year olds? Yeah, we had a few of those guys. Uh, See, that was the biggest thing is when I got here, that was the first thing he wanted to address was, you know, the older kids and them kind of influencing our younger kids. So we separated them as much as we possibly could early on. So we can kind of, you know, into, into kind of enter, uh, how do you want to say it, interject our kind of culture we wanted to uh, put in for our younger group. So, yes, we definitely see a lot of that with our older cats. So I want to. I think here they just the UIL here in Texas. I think just passed some sort of or I don't know an ordinance or a rule now as far as social media talking to parents and this and that. Where you can be if you're a couple times and you are the team. I think I don't know if they get suspended for the game or whatnot. You're kicked out of the game and everything else. So they're they're starting to crack down on it more and more from what I'm gathering. 
as, as far as the social media, because I've been to a high school game where kids are hitting the ball and they're turning around yelling at parents from from the other team in the bleachers. Really? So, yes. Just, I mean, what, what has happened to the point where you've got to turn around and it's not even baseball anymore. You've got – and then the fans are yelling back and forth. I mean, at the fans, and it's become – I don't even think it's even baseball anymore. It's just become this this sort of media circus of hey, look at me. I've, you know, I've done this and I've, you know, I've did this on social media. Yeah, no, we had a. I think I just we just had a little problem with you know because I coached first base at the time, so uh, young first base. But I think I was with my 15 year. You know, I was with the 16 year, and it was a close play at first. I thought he drug his foot off the bag. I thought it was questionable, but I'm still going to try to argue it and get the call. And the 16 year old turned around to me and said something, but he ended it with like, bruh, like, come on, bruh, like whatever. And I go, I'm not your bruh. You know what I mean? Like trying to put him in his place, like whether I'm right or wrong, you know, you need to respect me. But little chirps like that from this team was happening throughout the whole game. And I'm just thinking to myself, man, these kids are 16, like, who's teaching them, you know, the way to do this. And then you look at their coach and he's doing the same identical thing and not putting them into their place. And then another guy gets tossed because he's cursing at the umpire. And it's like, holy crap, like these kids are 16. What the hell's going on? So I totally understand where you're coming from. So the respect of, you know, for a kid to turn around and say something to to a coach, regardless, regardless of just a, a parent, this, an authoritative figure to be able to, to turn around and say something, we would have gotten our ass beat by whoever. Quickly. And if my parents weren't there, I would have probably got spanked by somebody. And then when I got home, I would have got in trouble again. So for sure, that stuff did not happen during our era. It or was, it, yeah. yeah, put it real quick. Were you in, was, uh, thinking about the whole first base incident? Were you, in, were you in, in Kansas City when Gamboa got attacked when you were in Chicago? That was in Chicago, yes. Remember that? So that's what I'm thinking. That's probably one of those kids that jumped over there just because he didn't like something that happened and went over there and started, you know, and, and started that. I mean, look at what, what, what was the craziest, but coolest experiences ever after the fact, obviously we were worried for, you know, Gamboa at the time, but how it played out was immaculate. Where were you at that moment? When I, I you know, they only show us just, we, we don't pick up the beginning part. We only get the fact after the kids on the field, where were you at that moment? I was sitting in the, I think we were just coming in. We're about to, no, we were hitting, obviously, because Gambo was, I was sitting in the dugout somewhere. And I was probably, I don't know, eighth, ninth to get there, so to speak. But once we all got there, you could tell who got him first was Raul (laughs) Ibanez. And the funny part about it is, is he, he was just so, you know, smart at the time and, very aware of the surroundings because he's telling us like surround us surround me surround me so no one can see and he is just going to work on this guy in the middle of this crowd you know what i mean so instead of us all trying to jump on this guy at the same time it was perfect because raul just let him have it and nobody can really see what was going on you know (laughs) oh it was perfect you wouldn't think about something like that that of happening but i mean it's (sighs) I don't even know what what would cause somebody to come on the field, and it, that's what made me think about when the, that kid at first base turned around and said something to you. I'm thinking about that because I wanted to ask you about the whole Gamboa thing, but that's pretty funny for a role to, to to even to even be that aware to say, "Hey, build a wall and do that." Because that yeah, he, the heat of one of those things like you know after the game, like we're just laughing about it because it's like, who thinks of that in that moment? You just want to complete rage and just go get this guy because of what he's doing but it was just just shows you the type of guy Raul Banyas is just a smart very intelligent dude and people don't understand is we're we're not allowed to go into the bleachers but as soon as somebody comes on the field they're fair they're fair they're fair game so (laughs) I didn't understand I get well, I don't even get hitting on the field, but, you know, you see it happen. I just didn't understand why are you attacking the oldest man on the field. <laughs> like, that just didn't make any sense at all. That's what I was wondering. If something had led up to or it was just somebody just being being stupid. We had... Being completely stupid. It was just completely random. We saw, we were in uh, Colorado one night, and the, and the uh, fence by the field, there were about 
mid thigh high and uh somebody had jumped on the field i think there was three of them in the front well a guy had jumped over his buddy had jumped over realized that he shouldn't be got back because then the guy who was on the field turned to look where his buddy was and here comes one of the security guards just form tackled this guy right in the middle of the field <laughs> And you see, you see that stuff, and people don't. And you see a lot of them, though, too. On they're chasing guys around in circles, right? And you'll see. Uh, I think Matt Dias tripped one guy one time. He was in Philly, tripped somebody. They had, I mean, he had naked people running around. You see some people doing some, <laughs> just some really dumb stuff. And those are probably the people that, like you said, turned around at you at first base and said, "Hey, bra, what you got?" Yeah. You know. <laughs> But we live in a, a copycat world, you know what I mean? You get people who do stuff, they're influenced, and, oh, I can do that too. So, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Now with social media, I'm sure they just do it. They'll pay people to do it, to go on these fields and everything else. I mean, you've you've got uh, – I was watching uh, last night. That somebody had – they've got, like, this home run chain. It's this gigantic hood ornament that these guys are walking around with. Just, I mean, it's – I mean, that's what we need to do, just find something to brand that we can sell for when guys, you know, when they do something. Maybe when a guy, a pitcher strikes somebody out, they pull one of those poppers out, you know, and it celebrates because you see all this celebration and stuff. Yeah, we're the old guys now. We live in a different time. It's just, it's different nowadays, right? Yeah. You played with some with some some veterans, some salty guys, you know, Sweeney, Graffinino, right, with some guys that were some old school guys. They wouldn't have let any of that stuff fly. Oh, definitely not. Uh, Randa, he was yep. probably the leader of the team, the fact he kept us in line. You know what I mean? He wouldn't have went for that at all. Believe me, he put me in my place quite a few times. And, I mean, I just try – I can't it's, – it's hard to watch now, just just in general trying to watch the stuff that goes on. And, uh, and we, we've we talked about there's nobody – there's no real veteran present. Like, like you said, with those guys, it's somebody that would just put everybody together, right? I mean, do you what do you see nowadays when you're sitting there watching big league baseball games? Uh, I'm seeing, you can tell the teams that do have that, uh, where there's a good mixture of leadership, older guys, younger guys, but being taught the right way. And then you see that younger kind of do whatever I want to do, uh, guys that will not make adjustments or who are very stubborn in what they want to do, which is, you know, swing for the fences. So I think that's why averages are what they are nowadays, you know, trying to hit 300 seems like a lost art so to hear an interview with who was it i think it was aaron judge what one of the best hitters in the game to still put an emphasis on wanting to hit for average i think that's how you know everyone should think hitting wise and do you think that starts from uh, you know from the manager down is it because if it's it's a veteran manager that's been around that understands what guys go through what it's yeah. going to take to keep or is it so you, so you think there's a, a big, lot of it plays into it. I think money is huge, too. I think the guys, in, the way they're paid, I mean, fuck. It's kind of hard not to, excuse my French, to listen to somebody or not think you know the best way to kind of uh, do it. But I definitely think it needs a strong presence to, no matter what the situation is, is to tell you straight up how it should be. And I just don't think there's a lot of that. Because uh, in our day, it was a lot of that, you know. And the, yeah, the veteran guy, but you see the mass. That's a good thing what you talked about as far as the, the, how this disparity, the disparity is between the teams that, that are successful. If it starts from the top down, the managers that have played, you know, I mean, look at you know the yeah. Yankees with Boone. You've got you've got Dave Roberts out in L.A. Absolutely uh, doing this stuff. So do you think that's where it starts? Oh yeah, I was just gonna. You picked the first two guys I was gonna pick. Where because those, I mean, the Dodgers obviously my favorite team since I was born, since I grew up there. And you can just tell they play exactly how he played. And when you watch Boone's team, they play exactly how he played. You know what I mean? So it's, you can just tell when you played so for so many coaches where you get around that one coach where you'll run through a wall for him. You love this guy. And, you, you know, and then you're, you're wondering why. And then you get the process of different coaches and mindsets and, yeah, the disparage nowadays, you can definitely tell it's pretty blatant to see. The uh, Who was your manager when you were in Kansas City? I had a few. My first one was Tony uh, Muser, and then Tony Pena, and then we had Buddy Bell for a little bit. 
That's right. So you had some guys that that, that played a little bit. It's uh, you know at, at that level that were hard that were hard nosed players to to see that. You don't see a lot of of those guys. I was actually I was watching the other day. It was uh, Rocco Baldelli. Uh, he's you know he's he's an old school guy as well and he's you know i think minnesota's i think they're leading the central right now at this point um he's a fiery guy as well so you know he's one of those managers too you throw into that whole that whole mix of being able to get it to filter down and i wonder if it filters down even beyond the major league level you know to see oh. the guys are coming up i don't watch very much baseball on TV, but you know you watch highlights or what have you and i just saw the other day i was just one of those things i kind of said to myself about Rocco Baldello. I was like, I could play for that guy. But it's always saying that about guys who used to play the game. They just have that, uh, and not all, but most have that kind of feel. They just know uh, how to approach, you know, those guys on that level because they've done it. And, you know, they know how they like to be coached. And they don't think outside of the box or try to reinvent the wheel. They just do it the right way and go hard. And their players respond well to it. And you see, you know, they, you, you see nowadays guys, we've, we've talked about too, as well as, as far as the pitchers and stuff. I mean, I wonder if they're able to filter that down through their pitching staffs. You know, guys are only throwing five innings. You're, and then they have a sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth inning guy. You know, you talk about 300 not being the norm. What, what, what is it going to get to? Is 220 going to be the, you know, the, the standard, right? Because nobody wanted to get to the Mendoza line hitting wise. But now you've got probably half of the league right at the Mendoza line. So, I mean, it just becomes, you know, what do you do then as far, how do you get these guys to buy into this old, the back to the old school way of doing it? I really don't know. And if I had the answer to that, I'd be a very rich person, but <laughs> uh, the, a very long process because of how quickly analytics kind of took over and the thought process of uh, what stats or, what approach was relevant or important, I should say. And, you know, and then you got to come to the play and there is some kind of intelligence that kind of keeps the, you know, those averages of the Mendoza line. Like, I can't stand the shifts, but they do work, you know? And I think a lot of guys would be getting more hits. But for the most part, I do agree that, you know, the mindset of, you know, power numbers rather than just being a threat, you know, all four or five at bats has changed drastically. Yeah, guys trying to hit down ten to one, trying to hit an eight run homer in the ninth inning. They hit a solo home run and they're acting like they just won the World Series. You know that that stuff wouldn't fly when we were playing. It's just a matter of you know of acting like you've been there. But um, you know, guys, you know, twenty wins was was this, was the norm. I mean, is that? 15 good wins going to be it because there might, I think it might be a couple guys get to 20 this year maybe I don't know but you just don't see the longevity of guys and they're I mean who's going to say that even their career wise I mean it's just okay I can only pitch what is it going to come to like an eight man rotation at some point yeah we were talking about this the other day with the coaches it's just as far as I guess the guy had a ACL or not ACL injury but a Tommy John surgery and we just talk about injuries you know overall and it's like the more we reduce throwing and working and all that, doesn't it seem like the more the injuries there are? Uh, you know, back in the day, uh, a Bob Gibson or that era, those guys threw all the time. Why were they never hurt? Yeah, I just, I, it's funny you mentioned Bob Gibson. I was reading something on Facebook about he had 13 shutouts one year pitching. Well, I mean, you just, that, that stuff's not, not even the norm anymore it just becomes i think are the guys too lean now they don't they don't just i mean you go in i want to i want a cold beer i want a candy bar oh. or something i don't want some damn gluten-free msg crap we just instilled long toss with our position players this year obviously very basic to me and you but to them it was like a task and it's like why do you think you have no arm strength why do you think you can't throw more than three innings or four innings if you're a pitcher? And it's like, this is what I had to do all the time. And I'm a prime example of it because that was probably the weakest part of my game. But by the time I got, you know, to the big leagues, I'm not going to say it was the best, but it was much improved, you know, because of the process of strengthening my arm and throwing every single day and long tossing no matter what. But that's kind of a lost art. It is. You remember you were talking about spring training. It was what 
10 minute toss, right? It took you 10 minutes to get out to 250 feet and back. Now yeah. it becomes, it seems like it's 10 minutes of running their mouth and they get out to maybe 90 feet and then they're back in. And, and I look, are you guys done? Have you guys even thrown? Uh, no. No. There's no, it, it's the motivation part of it. How do you motivate somebody to, to want to make themselves better, to keep themselves healthier? Uh, you guys don't know what you're talking about until they get to that point. Then they realize, like you said, I mean, they're, well, how old are the kids? You said 12, 13, learning the long toss? 13 to 18 nowadays. So they feel like, you know, obviously it's a more of an ego thing. Well, I can't throw it that far. Go, well, that's not what it's about. Whether it bounces a couple of times, it's about doing it and the process of continuing to do it. Same thing as when you lift weights. The more you do it, the stronger you get. So it's like trying to, but nowadays I think it's about them trusting you and liking you before I get their ear, so to speak. So I've been blessed to, you know, be able to relate to these kids, whether they are 12 to 18, whatever it may be, uh, you know, to, I don't want to say become it, but yeah, somewhat become their friend before I start to, you know, instill my thoughts of how I want, you know, the game played or what have you. I just think that's been a better approach, especially with these younger kids now and day with the social media and all that. You know, talking to a kid, you know, on a group text through social media, it's just a different approach. Because, you know, my other coach is a lot older. So when he sees me do that, he's like, you do that? I'm like, of course I do. I get their ear way better than just yelling on the field. You know what I mean? So uh, I think it's just multiple routes of how I have to deal with these kids nowadays. It almost sounds as if you – you're as a coach you're a coach you're not supposed to be their friend you're supposed to be their coach right just like you're supposed to be their your kid you're, you're their, their parent you're not their friend and I think that's that's what it seems like they all we have to be friends first so then if something happens they can say well you know well we're not friends because you hurt my feelings there's no it's almost like there's no you know there's there's no uh, uh I can't think of the right the word right now just to there's no line to say I'm your coach that's it. You know, yeah. I'm not here to be your, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to be your coach to make you better. If you yeah, become I'm, friends after, yes, but it's almost like they want it. They want it in reverse order. Yeah. That, I just learned that friend stage of getting to become friends is a very fine of not taking it too far and still obviously um, implementing my authority, so to speak, but not being just so negative all the time because uh, these kids are very sensitive these days. So, Ooh. Uh, you got to get to that point where you're comfortable in reading who is able to handle criticism and who can't take an ounce of it. But you've all got to go through that stage. So I don't want to get I want to get close, but not too close to the point where, you know, they think we're too friendly. Yeah. And it's and they're going to they think, well, now they're going to get it's not going to be that way. And, you know, the higher you go the more that these coaches are going to are going to drill it into you they're going to be on top of you i mean it's you know i, I just don't i don't i don't even understand it well they, they like you said this hypersensitive era now of oh my gosh you hurt my feelings i'm offended what am i supposed you know i'm going to make yeah. you lose your job as opposed to wait i'm doing my job but your kid <laughs> doesn't like it so now we're just going to get we're going to fire you we're going to move on to somebody that just becomes a pushover to where the kids basically right the inmates are running the asylum is what it sounds like. Absolutely. That's basically what it is. And it's and it's hard for coaches, especially, you know, guy you know, like you and me, we're old school guys. We you know, that's how we were raised, right? You're not okay. You said something bad about me. Okay. It's it's fuel for the fire. It's almost as if there's no fire in them to even fuel. It's just a matter of you know, like you said, I'll get rid of you and I'll go somewhere else. You see kids even jumping teams, going, going, well, he didn't like it, so I go to this team, I go to this team. I mean, hell, you even see it in the big leagues now, guys. I mean, really? Juan Soto, 450 whatever million dollars? You couldn't to stay there to play? You wanted, you wanted more? Or is there more? To, I mean, I'm sure there's more to it, but you know what I mean, Kenny? There's not just that. It's, it's, it's at every level, it seems like. It seems to be. Yeah, I mean, it's just the way it is now. I think it's a battle that, we are going to lose as far as us old school guys and how we feel because I just think that's the norm. Uh, I think there are avenues, obviously, for coaches like ourselves, and there's plenty of them to instill our ways and hopefully, but it just seems uh, the way it's set up and you know, 
how people were paid and obviously now in college you know getting the deals that these guys are getting which are deservingly so it's just going to be tough to navigate that kind of thinking yeah the, yeah the paying of, i mean i understand that you know the paying the athletes to a certain extent but i that almost seems to me like that's almost you know uh tampering right boosters hey we're paying some i just saw some college just got a whole bunch of money to give their kids all these athletes and everything else i'm thinking what's going to stop these guys from doing it in seventh and eighth grade now right paying these kids to to come and it just seems like we're it's it's it, we're fighting an uphill battle with this in, in any any sport in any part of, the, of what we know is what our normal is and it's you know it's and it's not easy at all yeah, i think we want to say it's over but i'm pretty sure it's over yeah used to think of it you know yeah and it's you know like i said it's all we can do is just keep is keep pushing and keep doing what we know is right because at some point it, it's gonna it's gonna circle back and you know people are gonna go you know that's how it is and i understand how things move but still it's just not when you take away the purity of something just to add your own little shtick to it and everything else you're just not it's not what it was you know you're doing it's like movies they do remakes of classic great movies why why ruin it yeah, absolutely. I hear you. Totally agree. <laughs> so, but Kenny, man, I appreciate it. You know, sitting down to talk today about this kind of stuff, just, you know, hearing what, what you deal with and what everybody, you know, what you're seeing these days. And it's, you know, it's, it's tough, but like I said, hopefully we can start to change a little bit. You know, you change one person, you've done your job doing it. So, you know, I wish you luck with all that stuff. And uh, like I said, we'll stay in touch, man. have to get you back on here at some point again. Absolutely, man. I really appreciate it and love what you're doing. Uh, definitely had fun being on here talking about the issues and, and where we are today. So thanks for having me, my man. Yeah, absolutely. Enjoy your uh, enjoy your vacation here while you get a chance, man. And I just realized one thing. The name of it is Big Head, and I'm looking at your head <laughs> out of that visor, and it's dying. I'm loving it. <laughs> I mean, it's just sticking right out the visor. And I'm like, oh, perfect. Who even says it's attached in the back? It might just be sitting right. on <laughs> I go, perfect name, right? <laughs> it was. So, man, I appreciate it, Kenny. And uh, like I said, I'll be in touch, man. My pleasure. All right, man. Thanks. You too. All right, man. See you. See you.